Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, thank you for asking me. I'm looking forward to it. So, congratulations on the E.B. Wilson Award. Thank you so much. And what does that mean to you? Oh, it's wonderful. Um, I remember coming to my very first cell biology meeting many years ago as a, as a graduate student and seeing the Wilson Award being given, and it just seemed something, and I couldn't even begin to think that I could one day be the recipient of that award. It's just, it's such a very, very high honor from a society of extraordinary scientists, and to have that group of people, the people who were involved in deciding on the prize, decide that I was worthy of it, it meant a lot to me. Tell us a little bit about some of the work that's gone into that. Protein folding, I believe, is, is your field. Right. So um, protein folding is really a very central aspect of translating the gen genetic code into actual meaningful action in the cell. The proteins really do just about everything. But, uh, and they come out, the, you know, the genetic code is linear, long, d double helix. When proteins are first made, they're very long strings of amino acids, and they have to fold up into really complicated shapes to, in order to function. If they don't get those folds right, they either just don't work, which can be very bad, or they can go off and do even worse things and mess other things up, and that's even worse. And um, the difficulty is that the proteins have to reach their folds in the very, very crowded environment of the cell. So really, all aspects of biology are touched by this. Um, these proteins, if they don't fold properly, they can cause neurogenic diseases. Um, if they don't fold properly, they can cause cancer. Um, they can cause cystic fibrosis. Um, but they're so interfaced, this protein folding problem is so centrally placed in what constitutes what a cell will be, what biology is, um, that it also can even influence the course of evolutionary processes, the way the genetic code is translated into actually biological traits, uh, protein folding is sitting in the middle there and it can strongly influence the development and appearance of new traits and their inheritance through evolution. And can you give me some examples of, of where protein folding uh, relates to uh, combating some of the diseases that we face these days, cancer or such? Sure. So um, cancer, for example, there's, there's a couple of different ways that we've worked on. One is there's a, these proteins need help. <laughs> And getting folded. And so one of the things I've been working on is a whole series of proteins that, that help other proteins fold. That's their dedicated job in the cell. One of these is called HSP90, and I'll be talking about that in the, in the Wilson uh, talk. But we, we first got, uh, got involved in HSP90. We were trying to figure out, well, what does this protein do? We, we knew it was made in vast quantities whenever cells are stressed, yeah, but we didn't know what it did. And it some other laboratories um, just coincidentally had run into it as being bound to a, an oncogenic protein, that is a protein that causes cancer. And that protein had mutations in it. And, uh, it, we've, and it, we found that our heat shock protein, our, our protein assistant, was actually binding to that protein and not keeping it repressed as, as had previously been thought, but rather helping it to fold properly and get activated. So in the absence of this helping, this protein whose main function really is to, to help, it unfortunately takes this mutated protein that has a potential to cause cancer, and it helps that protein acquire the right fold that'll, that'll allow it to be active and cause cancer. So that's an example. The, um, and then there's, this, there's a whole very much larger, broader array of proteins called the heat shock proteins in general that do various things like that that help to move the cancer state forward. You have a reputation, uh, so I believe, within the profession for uh, taking risks. Yes, I do. Is that, is that a reputation that, uh, is that right? I think it's a well-founded reputation. I take a lot of risks. I, uh, I try to do high-risk, high high-payoff work. And, and is that I, important, do you think? I think it's extremely important. First of all, it's, it's you know, you have to be willing to uh, be wrong sometime and admit that, oh my gosh, that really didn't work. Um, you have to be careful about um, if graduate students get involved in that kind of work, making sure that they're not going to be stuck there for years uh, doing something that won't work. But um, if you don't take high-risk projects on when the payoff could be enormous, um, I think that we're, we're really not fulfilling our, our obligations to society to try to make science, uh, to empower science to really help the, benefit the human condition. So one of the risks I took, I talked about actually in a lecture yesterday, um, 
was to realize that the neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease are diseases of protein folding. And I've been working on protein folding for so long and I know a lot about it and I know it's very highly conserved across all biological systems. So we got the idea to take some of these proteins that cause when they misfold, cause Parkinson's, for example, or Alzheimer's, and put them in these little simple cells called yeast cells that you can just manipulate far better than any other cell type. And of course, they made the cells sick, and they might have made the cells sick in a way that was meaningless, <laughs> or they might have made the cells sick in a way that actually related to what they're doing when they misfold in the brain. And so that was a risk. It could have gone either way, really, but uh, luckily it went the way where <laughs> It, in fact, they misfold and misfunction in this simple cell system in a way that does relate to what's happening in neurons. And so we're now actually hoping, I, I think it's a reasonable expectation that we will be able to use these very simple cells, which are easy to grow and easy to manipulate, to try to devise therapeutic strategies that would work for the human brain. Now, finally, one of the, one of the themes we picked up on at the conference this week is community the importance of a diverse community and the importance of scientists working together. How important do you think that is? Oh boy, I think it's uh, enormously important. I, um, I have gained so much from the uh, generosity of my colleagues. And I think when you're generous with other people about what you know and when you've got a new result and you don't try to keep it to yourself but you talk about it, um, you know, sometimes you get scooped, sometimes you get hurt. But more commonly, people will say, oh, that's, th 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 and they'll talk with you about their new findings and what they're thinking and what's at the forefront. And you can actually make things happen and move more rapidly that way through this, through this community of trusted colleagues that, than you otherwise would be able to be. The other thing I think that's really remarkable about the scientific community that we're a part of is how international it is. I have had students and postdocs from all over the world, literally all over the world, and I think, uh, and uh, with all sorts of different cultural backgrounds, all sorts of different scientific backgrounds, from engineering to chemistry to cell biology to genetics, and I think that that diversity itself is an extremely empowering thing, especially when you're trying to find new solutions to tough problems. So I think I think the science community is is, is just an absolutely fantastic one. I think sometimes. Um, I, I, there, are, there are some aspects of that community and the way it operates I don't like. I don't like the way uh, how, how nasty people can sometimes be in the anonymous reviewing process. But um, I, I, in, in so many other ways, it plays out as being one of, the, one of the best, most social activities I think a human being can undertake because you interact with so many different people on such a high intellectual level uh, it, with this voyage of dis aspect of feeling that you want to be on a voyage of discovery together, it's it's just just really great. Well, thank you ever so much indeed. Really appreciate it.